Fox, please. The Boogeyman is at large. There will be no pause. There will be no empathy. He is an apex predator. I'm gonna smack him with this stick, boys. Halloween Kills continues 2018 Halloween's continuation of the original Halloween, in which Michael Myers returns to do what it says on the box. And initially, I wasn't gonna cover this movie because back when I covered the 2018 version where I discussed the negative effects of humanizing Michael Myers into a directionless old man with no consistency, turns out it became the worst video I've ever done. <laughs> That was until recently I was approached by a dark force that offered me a deal. In return for a small favor that you're gonna find out about later on here, that dark force gave me the idea to use Halloween Kills as a basis to discuss those same negative points about Michael Myers as last time, so that I could better convey what I was trying to say and this way reclaim my pride hurt by all those dislikes. Well, that didn't really work out, because Michael Myers in Halloween Kills is fantastic, with all the issues I tried to explain last time having been addressed. His humanity is gone, he's been given a clear motivated direction, overall he's been turned into an unstoppable entity consistently destroying everything in his path in a way that nobody is safe. Not firemen trying to help, not even cute innocent drones. Finally, Michael Myers is living up to the legendary terror of his name. Unfortunately, that didn't really matter, because the rest of the film is not quite as fantastic. It's difficult to put into words just how much of a mess this movie feels like, but let's just say that even the enormous positivity of Michael Myers in his ultimate form isn't enough to withstand the pummels of negativity inflicted by the movie he's in. Nah, beat the goofy out your ass, boy. If I'd have to identify the core source behind Halloween Kills' biggest problems, it might be its unhealthy obsession with the franchise. It's like the filmmakers here were so excited about continuing the story and world of Halloween that they totally forgot to make an actual Halloween movie of their own, to the point where I do want to apologize for calling A Quiet Place Part 2 one of the worst horror sequels, because clearly it was a stupid thing of me to say. And so today, let's dig deeper into Halloween Kills' toxic obsession of continuing the franchise and the pitfalls that obsession can lead to, so that we can avoid them in the future. Here's how to mess up a sequel so badly that even an inform icon isn't enough to save it. The first big sequel problem here is that instead of anchoring the story in a specific character's journey, Halloween Kills hops from one legacy character to the next in a way that the story never seems to begin. For example, the movie opens with Officer Hawkins, who's been tied to the events of the original movie, awaking from the apparent death he was given in 2018. After which we then go to this 10 minute flashback showing how he encountered Michael Myers on that day 40 years ago and how Michael kinda made a mockery out of him. Having spent the first 12 minutes on Hawkins, the audience then kinda expects him to be the main POV anchor into the story. Like, okay, we're following his journey of trying to stop Michael and get redemption for what happened 40 years ago. Until it then quickly turns out that no, Hawkins gets brought to a hospital where he stays the whole time without doing anything, meaning that we're now over 10% into the movie and still looking for the person to begin the main journey with. Well, our next expectation is obviously to then once again follow Laurie from the original and her family like was the case in 2018, that this movie is about their journey to stop Michael Myers for good. Except it's not, they have so little screen time and so little to do in regards to Michael for the majority of the story that they're not our main anchoring protagonists either. No, no, no. 
No, get away. What are you Karen? doing? No, Stop right get now. away. I am not going to let you do this. Well, the next candidate is this doctor couple who we meet in the bar after the prologue and spend a fair amount of time to get to know. Standing up for yourself in these situations. That's right, you're right. No, stand up for myself. So tomorrow morning, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to quit that punch job. Dr. Mathis. And it's like, ah, okay, the movie is actually about this new couple and their outside perspective. About them joining forces with a few legacy characters whose value comes fully from having been in the original to go out and hunt Michael Myers down as civilians. Okay, now we're getting started. Oh, never mind. And they they die immediately. <laughs> but then again, one of the legacy characters the couple was with survives Michael's attack here, so maybe the whole point was to use the couple to introduce us to her, and the movie is actually about uh, uh no, she just disappears as well. Well, then we're also with this guy couple that lives in Michael's old house, so maybe they have some kind of a special role and no, they exist just to introduce Michael's house. Do you have any idea whose house this was? Yes. Well, then we also have this Tommy guy who we also meet at the bar and realize to be one of the kids tied to the original events. And to be fair, he is the biggest candidate for the main hero. He's the most dedicated, most active, so maybe the movie is primarily about his journey. Except it isn't, because he doesn't really do anything as much as he rallies other characters to make key plot events happen. Michael Myers will be executed tonight! Yes, sir. We yes, need sir. All of yes, sir. He even becomes more of an antagonistic force later on that Laurie's side has to deal with, so clearly he's not our anchoring POV protagonist either. And oh, would you look at that, we're now 80 minutes in. So what I'm trying to get across is that this film isn't a progressive journey as much as it is a collection of individual instances with minor characters. And while introducing smaller characters is fine, you still need one or more primary POVs to anchor the story in. Infinity War has a gazillion tiny characters, but their existence is built on a primary character trying to solve an obstacle to get one step closer to the story's ultimate destination. It's not like we just stop to give them their own few minutes of screen time with no larger progression. I understand the urge to feature legacy characters and locations, but in order to begin a story, you first need to pick whose story it is. If our anchor is Hawkins, then make the journey about him trying to stop Michael Myers and meeting legacy stuff on the way. If our anchor is also Michael, then show things from his perspective instead of the perspective of every minor character he meets. In any case, you cannot wait 80 minutes to finally reveal that, oh, the movie is actually about Laurie's family family once again, because that's not a movie, it's a collection of loosely joined short films starring all your favorite legacy material from before. But before we can move on, I'm first supernaturally bound to shout out the dark force from the origins of this video story that made it all happen, Shudder, which is basically a streaming service like Netflix, but cheaper and dedicated exclusively to spooky horror thriller content that's perfect for the season we're in right now. Ditch. They offer more mainstream releases like the OG Halloween, but then there's also a bunch of less obvious curated content that you might not have heard of, like the Autopsy of Jane Doe, which I really recommend to see what you can accomplish with a single location. Then they also have their own original series like Creep Show, that's their flagship show from the producer of The Walking Dead, and original movies like Revenge, which I also recommend to see how to properly make a badass empowerment film, plus much much more, especially now with their ongoing 61 Days of Halloween campaign. So to get started on streaming more personalized horror thriller content you're not already familiar with, from supernatural to slashers to documentaries, Shudder's expertly curated collection is a great way to do so. And what's best is that right now you can try it out for 30 days for free. Just go to Shudder.com and use code Filmento. It's basically a free month of spooky movies and shows, so take the deal like I did. The second main sequel problem with Halloween Kills is that it doesn't seem to care about telling a story as much as it cares about reminiscing about stories already told. Hey, turn it up! Previously on Halloween. The first obvious way this manifests is through Officer Hawkins' flashbacks, which are very cool because we get to revisit the events of the original movie in a new way. And while it is a bit weird to be spending all this time on the past of a character who has nothing to do with the events going on currently, the flashbacks do build up Michael's motivation of going home, so in that sense it is actually pretty useful. He used to stand in his sister's bedroom and stare out the window. Maybe he wasn't looking out. 
Maybe he was looking in at himself. The real issue here though is that the time spent on showing what has already happened is only a tiny fraction of the time spent on discussing what has already been shown. Because the major part of this film consists of characters literally just talking about the original Halloween. Whether that means explaining other characters' place in it. We have Miss Mary in Chambers. She survived an assault. Whether that means explaining their own emotional connection to it. When they arrested Michael that night, my daughter was killed, so I wasn't there. Whether that means explaining personal insight from it. I came face to face when I was a kid. He creeps, he kills, he goes home. Or whether that means explaining just like technical details of it. He stabbed his sister in the tits right upstairs. I know that's just a few clips, but watch the movie yourself and you'll see that this goes on and on and on. To the point where it fully solidifies my belief that for an adaptation, you do want a writer and a director who are the opposite. One with a subjective understanding of what the source material can do, and another with an objective awareness of what should and shouldn't be done with it. Because even though the superfan filmmakers here might have been excited to dedicate 7 minute chunks for nothing but characters reminiscing about past events, most of the audience isn't exactly gonna be sharing that excitement. Because the casuals who don't care about the original are already asleep, whereas the fans are most likely just starting to wonder why they're listening to talk about the original instead of just like watching it. A madman escaped from a mental hospital. That crazy lady that almost got killed by Mike Myers. Teenage girls were walking home from Hanfield. What about that? Uh, Laura Stone. The house next door. And it gets to a point where this movie isn't discussing only what took place 40 years ago, but also what's taking place right now. Characters recount what happened in the 2018 version. It was his doctor, Michael's doctor. She put us in his path. He is the one that took him there. He Honest to God, they even repeatedly recount what happened in this movie 10 minutes ago. Lord, I mean, he killed Marion. He attacked Lindsay too. Because, you know, Michael Myers and the whole Halloween franchise overall is so cool Michael Myers. that it's entertaining to just talk about. Never mind looking for interesting ways for characters to find out all the information. Never mind basics of screenwriting. The information itself is great enough to just say out loud. The worst crime you can commit is telling the audience something they already know. Michael Myers is alive. Except in Halloween, which is such a cool franchise that it's not an issue. Again, I understand the urge to mine the source material for member berries and utilize the audience's pre-existing emotions. But let's be honest here, Halloween isn't Star Wars, it's not the MCU. And even if it was, you still can't rely on that pre-existence alone. Endgame does rely heavily on the past, but it's not like the characters there just talk about it for two hours, achieving nothing, until Thanos then finally arrives on Earth for the third. That's that's not how it plays out. You know why? Because a movie where characters just explain and talk about stuff that has already happened, that's not a movie. It's a filler episode of a TV show. The third key problem here is that this film is so obsessed with referencing the roots of the franchise that it does it even at the cost of the characters and whole world being degraded into nonsense. Take for example the basis for the plot, which is basically that the people of Halloween Town have become so fed up of hearing ghost stories about Michael Myers after the events of 40 years ago that they decide to go hunt him down themselves. <laughs> The idea of involving common townsfolk in Michael's pursuit is actually a great way to expand on his legacy from the first movie and overall a pretty interesting idea. But in practice, it comes with very destructive consequences. One of which is that from now on, all the horror encounters are like this playground scene, where essentially a hunter group consisting of the doctor couple and two women from the original movie are looking for Michael and then end up finding him. In other words, meaning that we have a legendary supernatural boogeyman killer being faced off against by three civilian adults and an elderly lady, which results in, well, what do you think? And I get why this happens. It's cool that the survivors from the original now return to fight back. It's cool when Michael grabs the lady the same way he grabbed her in the original. Such cool references and callbacks all around. But the issue is that this comes at the cost of basic sense. When average pedestrians go looking for Michael Myers and then die, 
Well, yeah. When a random house guy finds Michael in his home and then acts like his personal hype man instead of running away... Michael, you've come home. ...and then dies... Well, yeah. When a neighborhood dude goes to face Michael alone instead of calling anyone about it just because he has ties to the events of 40 years ago... Don't worry, guys. I saw Michael Myers once as a kid. ...and then immediately dies... Well, yeah. Like, the voluntary choices that lead to these moments are so incredibly needlessly dumb that it's impossible to really care about or invest in what happens. Because, I mean, what the f*** did you think was gonna happen? And honestly, even the whole evil dies tonight town hatred toward Michael overall is pretty weird, as becomes very evident in his hospital sequence where the whole place descends into enraged mayhem just because Michael Myers is thought to be in there, to the point where even actual doctors transform into blood-hungry wolves. And it's like, wait a minute, didn't Michael kill like five people in the original? Didn't the kills in the 2018 version happen so recently that people aren't even fully aware of them yet? Obviously, Michael Myers is a very meaningful name to some, but to have it turn an entire hospital into a scene straight from World War Z... Also, for some reason, this movie is adamant to maintain the nostalgic illusion from the 70s that the only reason Michael Myers can function is because everyone else is an idiot. Guns, for example, nobody knows how to use them. Not angry teenagers, not overconfident adults, not even trained officers of the law. You know, having Michael overpower a group of angry townspeople is genuinely cool, but maybe at least try to make it somewhat believable. Because 20 people aren't just gonna wait around as they get mowed down one by one. If they're out in the open and able to run, they will. Some of them are gonna go to the officials right on the other street unless you specifically take that ability away. Like, please, your Michael Myers is great. He can function just fine even in a world that isn't moronic. But I cannot see I'm legally blind. And once again, I understand the urge to create references and callbacks and whatever continuations. But it cannot come at the cost of common sense. Because the audience has no sympathy for idiots. Mentally limited characters trying to overcome their limitations, that's great. That's something we can care about. But ordinary people who act idiotic just because your movie demands it, no. If they want to die so badly, then let them. In general, regarding everything we've talked about to today, it doesn't matter if your sequel has the best of intentions. It doesn't matter if all it tries to be is a faithful, most respectful successor to a franchise that it possibly can be. If you treat the audience like morons in order to achieve that, you're gonna get no sympathy.